We've asked you here because you have been um, working for a number of years in uh, the uh, at Yale's University in the major project around the Anthropocene, a research project, and you also published a book with almost that title. And um, you've been you've been uh, following, you might say, this 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 theme in much of your work. So we thought it really was a fitting start for the the conference that you gave us some uh, opening words, actually. So um, yeah, over to you, Nils. I'll turn off here. Great, thank you so much, Trevor, and um, and also to the other organizers for inviting me and for putting me in the first batch of speakers. It's such an honor. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there, and I hope you can hear me. I I think we all have had enough of Zoom in the last couple of years, but um, I hope you will bear with me. The reason I can't be there is that I am in Indonesia, six, six hours ahead of you, in Yogyakarta, doing field work with my partner, Sanne Krogrod, who's a musicologist, a Danish musicologist from Lund University, and you might be interested, or might not, I hope you might be interested to know that we're studying electronic music and noise music, trying to combine uh, the aesthetical approach that Sanne brings with the anthropological approach that I am bringing into a project, into a common approach that we call aesthetic anthropological. Um, I am afraid I have to leave immediately after my presentation because we're going to something that we've discovered here, something really interesting, namely tr horse trans rituals, fascinating things that I would have loved to tell you more about, but I can't because I am here to tell you about another overlap, I think, between uh, what you are doing in performing landscapes and what interests me, namely a shared interest in how we can reinvent the arts and the sciences uh, to better understand life on a disrupted planet. Uh, I will tell you about two insights, uh, one analytical, it's getting a bit langsamer, two analytical uh, in, two insights, one analytical and one methodological that come out of collaboration over the last 10 years with Anat Singh, uh, an anthropologist from uh, California and other good people into the uh, environmental and climatic disruptions of the current moment. And I hope these two small insights will interest you because like the performing landscape uh, laboratorium or uh, project, our approach is to understand the current moment the moment sometimes referred to as the Anthropocene through its landscapes. Um, I see the term Anthropocene is being, uh, it is several times on the menu for today's program. And I, I, I think you know more about it than I do, but nevertheless, since I get to go first, I thought I would begin with that term. And here is Sanna, where I will try to, <laughs> to share my screen and go into that bit and then choose this one. Oh, why can't I, why can't I share that now? Maybe because it's open. I have a fancy way of, of doing this that I think will work now. There you go. Yeah, there you go. The Anthropocene is a, is a problematic term. It's full of potholes and it reeks of many awful things that we don't like. It reeks of anthropocentrism, putting humans in the center. It is white. It reeks of male centrism. Most of the scholars who define it and work on it are male. It reeks on col of colonialism and of scientism and many other things. And for these reasons, a lot of people, particularly in the social sciences and the humanities have rightly criticized the term. At the same time, I think it does do some useful work. Namely, it allows for a, a transdisciplinary conversation between the arts, between the, between the arts, the social sciences and the natural sciences, a conversation that would have been impossible 
a mere two decades ago. And because of this possibility of a dialogue, at least, I think it is worth keeping. The Anthropocene essentially describes a world out of whack. The proposed term, it's a geological term, uh, earth sciences term out of the West, uh, suggests that we uh, have now, or at least since the 1950s, uh, entered into a new geological epoch in which the accumulated effects of human industrial activities fundamentally, and fundamentally here is the key word, change the cycles of the earth, uh, in, you know, the five key cycles of the earth, namely that of earth itself, of geology or the lithosphere, of air, the atmosphere, of water, the hydrosphere, of ice, the cryosphere, and of life itself, namely the biosphere. When I first began to think about and study the Anthropocene, basically in 2013, um, I was taken very much by a new article uh, by Timothy Morton, um, whose idea was that the Anthropocene is a time of what he called uh, hyper objects, that is objects like uh, global warming, ocean acidification, species extinction, or plastic pollution. And hyperobjects are interesting because they're different from objects. They like objects, they take place, but never somehow here, never here at this place. We can sense the warm weather, but the scale of global warming always is never at the at the scale of the here. It is always at the scale of the elsewhere of the everywhere. Uh, and that is what marks hyperobjects like uh, global warming, uh, because Morton goes on to suggest that they literally rob us of our senses because our phenomenal world no longer is our reality. It also therefore robs, of, robs us of the world itself, the world as a horizon in which um, uh, that stretches before us. Instead, he suggests reality, the reality of global warming, for instance, creeps up upon us like a car in the back rear mirror. Its reality is much bigger, much closer, uh, and much more dangerous than we are able to sense in the mirror. The Anthropocene, one might say, should have a, a warning label like that on rear, rear, rear view mirrors in the US, namely that reality is much closer and much bigger than it appears. This is a really compelling uh, uh, account of the Anthropocene in many ways. And if you're an artist, you are most likely also taken in by Morton's proposition because it goes on to suggest that the, that the aesthetics, aesthetics really is the only sensible way of understanding a time of hyper objects because art and aesthetics for the longest time have dealt exactly with hyper objects. Take for instance, the sublime, it's nothing if not a hyper object. But my involvement in Aura, Aarhus Anthropocene, Aarhus University research on the Anthropocene um, since 2013, the year Morton's article appeared, has increasingly taught me to be wary, to be skeptical of the implications of Morton's argument about the Anthropocene. Aura, the research project, was a collaborative effort between anthropologists, biologists, um, landscape historians, and STS scholars led by Anna Tsing and uh, myself that tried to reinvent the shared but broken uh, interest in field work, in going out into landscapes uh, to study social relations based on concrete participant observation, a shared interest between biologists and anthropologists. Today, and the term fieldwork is mostly associated with, with anthropology, but it, it's actually a term that was coined by biologists in, uh, in the late 1800s. Anthropologists traditionally do fieldwork in order to study relations between humans, while biologists do fieldwork to study relations between animals, uh, plants, and other living beings. This time of the Anthropocene, a time 
of human-made environmental destruction, which increasingly breaks down the distinction and the border uh, between human activities and natural ecosystems, so it seemed to us required both biology and anthropology to rethink their own objects of study, namely culture and nature, respectively. For our part, anthropology could simply no longer be content to study humans in a time of human-made made environmental dis disruption. Studying humans alone in today's world just seems not enough. And we realized that biologists for the longest time had studied what we thought was a human monopoly, namely social relations. Aura, the research project, was therefore an attempt to study exactly that social relations in a multi-species fashion, how humans and non-human beings make and break social relations to each other on a disrupted planet. The Anthropocene, so we realized, is, and this is in contrast to Morton, it is still a world for us, us humans, but also for other species, but it is not a world that we, as we think we knew it. It does take place, the Anthropocene does take place, it's not just a non-place, but it, it, its place-taking is one in which the local and the non-local is constellated, is uh, tied into each other in ways that we need a new language for. And the Anthropocene is full of agencies, but agencies that we are ill-prepared to describe both in the natural sciences and in the social sciences. So thinking through landscape became our ways of uh, reclaiming the Anthropocene as an empirical object of study. And I think this is where we, uh, what we've been doing speaks very much to what uh, you, Trevor, and, and your uh, group of people are doing in performing landscapes. So let me tell you about the two insights that are referred to, that I referred to above, because I think both of them um, have to do with uh, that commonality that I think we have, our disciplinary differences notwithstanding. So the first small insight is analytical. What if we imagine the Anthropocene today's world, not as an epoch, a time of hyper objects, for instance, but as a space that we still do not understand, a space that is intensely historical, but in new ways where the local and the non-local, the human and the non-human intersect in ways that conventional modern language and thought is still equi ill-equipped to speak about. Borrowing the term patch, from a branch of landscape biology called patch ecology, we suggest we suggested seeing the Anthropocene exactly as that patchy. In a special issue of the journal Current Anthropology from 2020, we presented 12 examples from a patchy Anthropocene, all of them uh, biological and anthropological. They're all fantastic examples uh, or studies, uh, and I encourage you very much to have a look, it's an open access uh, special issue. A patch is, a, is many things. It can be many things at many levels, but it can be, for instance, like in this uh, model, a stand of trees. It could also be a coral reef, or on a very small scale, it could be an animal track or a city. Uh, all are unique ecological landscapes, so patch eco ecology claims. Um, uh, and they exist on, on different scales. A city and an animal trail, for instance, are very different sizes. All are somehow unique in their its ecological features, but all are connected through multi-species histories to the mosaic of landscapes around this single patch at varying and multiple scales. So for instance, the stand of trees is connected to the meadow or field in which it grows. It depends on and is disturbed by the animals that traverse it. The soil of the forest may derive nutrients from the meadow and it is shaped by them. And in turn, it shapes the microclimate for the fields. So patch ecology is about ecological connections. What if we saw Anthropocene landscapes in the same way we thought a city? for instance, depends on resources derived from elsewhere. So a city is its own patch 
but that very patchiness changes the landscape of places of patches far away by the mining and farming on which the city depends. The city may be a smart, a green and recycled city, uh, but its resources are derived from landscapes of extraction and devastation that come far away. So the city might be green, but its greenness is actually fashioned by extraction and disruption elsewhere. Patches we are, we are suggesting are therefore unevenly co connected to each other. Our question in Aura therefore was this, what if we studied or aesthetically performed the Anthropocene through its patches? That is through the uneven conditions of more than human livability in the landscapes that are increasingly dominated by industrial forms. These industrial forms, uh, if you see, look at the, the lowest level of this model, you can see what, what, that they're very simplified forms. And we call these industrial forms simplifications. Could be a field, a city, a plantation, a road. A road or a plantation or a city or an offshore, a drilling platform are all ecological and political simplifications. Workers and motorists on a road, for instance, or uh, are simplified by capitalism. In the same way, the landscape of a road is simplified too, as undesirable species are evicted or exterminated from the clean human patches that we seek to establish. So this, you could say, is the story of biodiversity loss and of human dominance over the earth. This is uh, a conventional story of the Anthropocene, the story that has come to dominate our time. But patch ecology also allows us to uh, tell a different story, namely one, and a story that intersects with the landscape changes that we call simplifications. That second story is about pl pl proliferation, sorry, proliferation. An example of proliferation are the rats that thrive in the sewers of the city, the roots of hardy plants that break up the asphalt of the road, or the pests that attack the coffee plantation, or for instance, the wolves that seemingly against all odds return to our farming landscapes. Proliferation is the story of multi-species agency beyond humans, which is also a key to understanding the uneven landscapes of our time. It reminds us that human imperialism over ourselves and over other species is not the only game in town. The Anthropocene may literally mean the time of humans, but that is actually a misnomer. It's a wrong name that all too easily leads us to focus, as we have done since the start of the Enlightenment, on humans as the creators of history. But patchy landscapes of the Anthropocene are full of multi-species agency. They're full of geological agency, for instance. They're full of climate chemical agency, as global warming attests to. And they're full of the agency of species, invasive species, for instance, or so-called anthropophilic species, species that love human-made environments like the dandelions that we keep to keep, try to keep out of our lawns or the cows that multi have multiplied in, in recent decades. So patchy and landscapes are full, for instance, also of viral agency, as we saw in the recent pandemic, and of fungal and bacterial agency, as we see every day in the evolving superbugs of our hospitals and pig farms. So attending to multi-species and multi-elemental proliferation is, we think, key to understanding the uneven patches of the landscapes in which we live. So it's these two processes, simplification and proliferation that we're interested in because we think we see them as empirical phenomena that you can study in concrete landscapes. But the patch ecological perspective also allows us to trace the ways in which these landscape forms, simplification and proliferation are the result of historical connections across patches. These connections are human, they're colonial, they're capitalists, but they're also the result of multi-species geological and climate chemical shift, uh, chemical agencies. 
in a book called Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, we call these human and non-human agencies ghosts and monsters. Ghosts and monsters were meant to highlight connections. So a ghost, for instance, haunts us across historical time, while monsters connect species across bodies. A werewolf, for instance, is a monster exactly because it is both a wolf and a man. COVID-19 is another kind of cross-species monstrosity, bat, uh, virus, and human at the same time. Ghosts and monsters also remind us that there is an uncanny quality, there's an uncanniness to the agencies that are now moving the world, which largely are beyond mod modern language. We have given up to talking about the uncanny because we in, the, in modern uh, language don't really have a word for it other than the supernatural. But art and anthropology share an interest exactly in these phenomena, in the uncanny aspect of life. And my own understanding of the uncanny nature of the Anthropocene very much derives uh, from insights studying witchcraft and spirits here in Indonesia. <laughs> the second small insight into Anthropocene landscapes that I thought I would share with you is methodological because it's one thing to suggest that we need to study landscapes as patches, as I did just before in the analytical insight, but it's quite another to point to how you do this in practice. How do we study landscapes as patches in practice? So in a follow-up anthology to the Arts of Living book, uh, uh, a follow-up that is coming out next month, we seek to address this methodological question of the how. The book is called Rubber Boots Methods for the Anthropocene, doing fieldwork in multi-species worlds. Rubber Boots Methods is a term that grows out of our collaboration with biologists in Aura. The term Rubber Boots Biology in Danish Gomistole uh, Biologi, sorry, is a mainly derogatory uh, term used to refer to field biology, you know, those biologists that put on rubber boots in order to study, for instance, the breeding behavior of the butt-nosed frog. Rubber boots biology has largely been sidelined in recent years by more fancy uh, forms of biology, namely laboratory-based uh, and computer-based forms of biology like molecular biology, nanobiology, and so on. It is to a large degree laboratory-based and model-driven approaches uh, in natural sciences that have come to dominate. And this is not only bad because it is laboratory-based uh, and model-driven uh, forms of natural science that have made us realize the extent of climatic and environmental destruction in today's world. It is, in other words, laboratory-based and model-driven natural sciences that gave us the Anthropocene. We need these models and approaches in order to understand our world, and I think this is what Morton is pointing to. But these perspectives also sideline empirical landscape studies like rubber boots biology, uh, and it is the connection to this empirical biology that our research in anthropology seeks to reinvent because anthropology is also a fieldwork-based uh, science that insists on the importance of concrete, empirical, situated, empathetic, and critical participant observation. In Aura, we studied a boggy site near Herning uh, in Jutland in Denmark, called Subu. Subu is a former brown coal mine that supplied the majority of Danish energy needs during World War II, and which since has become a cultural heritage site. It is a landscape of violent simplification, as you can see on the photo on the right, uh, sorry, on the left. But it is also a landscape full of unexpected proliferation, as you can see on the photo on the right. To ac access this landscape and study its human and non-human histories, we had to wear rubber boots. 
rubber boots was the primary footwear also of the people we talked to and who live in Subi. And wearing these rubber boots made us realize that they allowed us peripatetic and peripatetic is I suppose a fancy word for saying walking access to the multi-species landscapes of humans, trees, fungi and red deer that we studied in Subu. But the larger point as we began to realize was that the multi-species method, uh, um, uh, that multi-species methods maybe more broadly could be likened to a kind of footwear. Like shoes, methods are actually prosthetics, things you put on that allow you access to somewhere or something. For instance, in this case, to the landscape that we like to study, that we wanted to study. Without rubber boots, uh, we couldn't access the lakes that were turned red by iron sulfate to study their sediments. And we could not access the forests to study how red deer moved in clear realization of where the human hunters had placed their hunting towers. Our methods in this, um, in this site in Subi had to be adapted to that particular landscape. But we also realized that every landscape requires its own kind of methodological footwear. So in the book called Rubber Boots Methods for the Anthropocene, 13 chapters describe 13 different rubber boots methods that are relevant to the very specific patches of landscapes that they study. One chapter discusses the riding horses as a form of rubber boots methods to study landscape changes in the Argentinian Pampas. You could not study those changes without uh, being on horseback, the, uh, the, ch the chapter argues. Another one uses boats as a form of rubber, uh, rubber boots method to study walruses and global warming in northern Greenland. Again, you cannot access walruses and the hunters that seek them without having a boat as well. And in my own chapter in the rubber boots uh, methods to the Anthropocene, I describe how I use uh, flippers and snorkel and mask on an Indonesian coral reef in order to follow my Papuan informants when they go spear gun fishing or in order to follow Western, Western tourists when they go scuba diving to marvel at the biodiversity of these coral reefs. In order to traverse the patchy uh, landscapes and seascapes of the Anthropocene, we in other words have to adapt our methods, our methodological footwear to the specific patch that we were interested in, in order to access it. So this was what we called rubber boots methods. And we did so in order to highlight that we borrow many specific concrete methods from rubber boots biology. But these methods, we also re insist, are never in, uh, innocent. So rubber boots methods, as opposed to rubber boots biology, is not merely a matter of putting on your rubber boots and then ignoring your boots. Rubber boots methods for us meant always realizing that your boots are, are exactly that, they're boots that tread down landscapes as well. And this is where I think the natural science methods need the critical perspective of the arts and the human sciences. Rubber boots, for instance, are made from rubber. Um, one of the most important and one of the first colonial products. Rubber boots methods therefore have to be reflexive about their own origins. Every prosthetic, every method has a history, often one inflected by colonial and capitalist power relations. Rubber boots methods of the Anthropocene uh, allowed us to approach every landscape on, on its own cu cultural and political and ecological terms, but also as part of a planetary, planetary history. Rubber boots methods do so by combining the empiricism that social science shares with rubber boots biology, combining that with the critical reflexivity that human science shares with art. For me, there are so many overlaps, overlaps in the peripatetic landscape approach that this uh, laboratory and the conference today emphasizes from the point of view of arts, performance, and aesthetics, if I get that right, and what we have tried to do in Aarhus for, for the last few years. I can think of three in particular that link performative landscapes to what one might call peripatetic landscapes. The one is this, 
how to make landscapes come, al come alive in all of their multi-species complexity and historicity in ways that reveal them as unique and local, but also in the throes of planetary change. The second is how to do this in a collaborative way that transcends ways of thinking and acting in arts, science, and the humanities, but that also involves other voices, decolonial voices, multi-species voices, elemental voices, ghosts and spirits. And this in turn leads to the third, how to, how to move beyond the Western male and scientific gaze of the Anthropocene to also see its uncanniness, its ghosts and its monsters. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Um, yes, a great start and definitely some good pointers in, in, in the last summing up, definitely. Um, but also, yeah, the rubber boots uh, as, a, as, a, as a methodology, the um, patchiness is also very relevant. Just before we move on, I mean, we've got a bit over time, but uh, if there's if there's something as a, a couple of people just have a quick comment or something, it has to be quite quick because we are running over. Um, and um, we've already moved on visually, but uh, is there somebody who'd just like to say something in response to this or from the comment? Yes. Did you find an article somewhere? Uh, Lots. Um, I think actually, if you go to the, um, can you go back to uh, back to this? Oh, he's, here. Here. Okay, no. he's there. Okay. All right. Um, I think on the Aura web, web page, which is still up and running, there are so many links to conferences, publications, research, and names of all the people who are still active. If they're not in August, there are other places. So there's a whole team there. Uh, I think it's a hugely well-documented project. Uh, unless there's something specific you, you could point at, uh, Nils? Um... I could mention that we have another project that is now ongoing called Blue, Multi-Species Ethnographies of Oceans in Crisis, and to which Anna Singh is also affiliated, and she's coming back to stay at Aarhus University from early April, I believe. So if anyone has any questions about publications or something, just send me an email and I will happily send it to you. I can also share the PowerPoint with anyone if you're interested. <laughs> 